welcome everybody welcome back if you've been to our forum before when i say our i mean nina to nina would you like to say hi nina hello everybody and i'm mark dean um together we coordinate a religion and art forum and james um is uh, an essential part of our team so thank you very much and um, we go in order alphabetical order um, of first names and that means that our first presenter tonight is David Leal, who is based in Lisbon and London. He recently graduated from uh, Central St. Martins in fine art. His work reflects on three main subjects, vision, religion, and sexuality, and primarily takes the form of video and objects. And David is currently exhibiting in New Contemporaries. Over to you, David. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen. So I would like to, first of all, thank both Mark and Nina for this invitation. Uh, it means a lot, especially coming from you too. And uh, thank you also because this is the first time that I'm being presented with the opportunity to do a presentation with no limitations. Um, the point I would like to make with this presentation is that spirituality, when is awakened within you for whatever reason, it can be a very useful tool, even uh, if outside the realms of religion. And it can be especially useful within a creative practice. Um, I would also like to point out that I will use the word religion a lot. And when I do so, I'll be referring to Roman Catholic, being that the one I feel embedded in. Um, now I would like to start by giving a very brief context on how religion was presented and present to me and around me uh, when I was a child. So I was born in a very small town in Portugal and my grandmother was in bed for decades. She was being fed and hardly speaking and doctors at that time couldn't really tell what was happening with her, even though now maybe they would call it a severe case of schizophrenia. Um, I say this due to the number of irrational fears that she developed throughout this period, like needles or lockers or water. Um, but so on my mother's wedding day, for everyone's surprise, she stood up, got dressed and uh, participated in the wedding day uh, like nothing was wrong with her health. Um, she was and is an extremely religious person and also due to the fact that this happened in a very small town, everyone saw this happening as a miracle. Um, I was born two years after this day, and this was a frequent conversation both inside and, in, and outside my family house. Um, my family is extremely thankful to God, and this gratitude feeling leads them in all their decisions uh, with their lives. Um, and me, on the other hand, um, I felt like this was a great uh, thing because I felt while growing up that religion was a theme in my family where I could explore abstract ideas and discussions, but uh, was also uh, complicated because there was also an obligation from me that I should believe and not doubt their explanation, which was hard, especially being myself an homosexual. And for years during my uh, teenage years, I rejected uh, the presence of religion in my life. Um, this is a work which I've made more than 10 years ago uh, when I was still in college. And even though I don't acknowledge it very much anymore, I think it might be valuable now to, um, to give a sense of how uh, I felt like religion was still triggering me. Um, I decided to do this piece when I saw in my grandmother's house a uh, fly landing and walking around uh, a figure of the Virgin Mary. And um, that really um, shocked me and shocked my eyes. And I understood due to that, that um, religious imagery was still very, very uh, important and a thing that would activate my eyes every time I would look at it. Um, at understanding this, I made a, a video work of, um, several recordings of every time a fly would land in my eye. Uh, 
years after the previous one. And I think this was one of the first works I did in which I started to understand what I wanted to go with my practice and um, what I wanted to do, to do with my fascination with religiosity and how the eye has a certain priesthood in it, uh, which takes me to see spirituality all around me. And the fly too, uh, I think became a very special symbol for me um, because like most of us, I was still uh, very much thinking about this dichotomy of is life a miracle or a coincidence? And uh, I felt like the fly was almost like a great argument on that, on that question. Um, years have passed and I came to London and in London I found myself working in places that are very sexually charged. Uh, the first place I found work was in a sex shop in Soho. And then after that, and due to the people that I met there, I went on working on uh, in gay saunas or sex parties. And um, this work uh, on the screen was one work that I did with one of the items that we had for sale on the sex shop. Uh, it's a fisting dildo named Praying Hands. Um, when I saw it, it screamed to me uh, images from my childhood and spoke to me directly about the tension that I share with many homosexuals that had religion present in their construction as a person. But also this object um, was kind of like a good translation for an idea that I always had that to praise, to stretch. And uh, just like this object does it literally, um, I think to praise, to stretch your thoughts to the point of pouring them out of your head towards somewhere else. Um, also in these places of employment, I have also understood the crossing points between religion and sexuality. And uh, I saw many situations in the sauna or in the sex parties that spoke to me about religiosity in the same way that uh, some scenes from the Bible do, uh, either on ideas of martyrdom or rapture or pain or submission or offering. And I've learned a lot in this uh, spaces. And I think it's funny how I spent so many years during my upbringing inside churches, thinking about sexuality. And then I see myself working in places like sex shops and I can't stop thinking about religion and faith. Um, since understanding how my eyes uh, feel about religion and uh, I started really aiming to expand that and to expand what I see as religion and what um, a religious image uh, can um, hold. And someone who helped me greatly in this was Michelle. Uh, I met Michelle in 2019 when she was working in the same charity shop as my flatmate. And we spoke a long time about faith. Uh, she started transitioning quite late in her life and she always found in God the strength to do so and to continue. Um, I asked her if I could do a film portrait of her, which fortunately she said yes. Um, she's part of a queer friendly church group in Waterloo that happens to be also one of my favorite uh, churches in London. So that had to be one of the locations for this film. Um, this film is currently being exhibited at the First Sight Museum in Colchester, and it's also online and in a platform that I can, uh, after, put the link in the chat if anybody is curious to see it. Um, here I have um, the title uh, for my dissertation, The Aesthetics of Doubt, of Doubt and Urges, Art as Production of Belief. And I named it like that because I was really, uh, I think my practice was really concerned in questions like, how does belief situate, situate itself alongside the real? And how is belief the impulse to my art? And uh, is every work of art an exercise of belief? Um, and I see my work engaging with theological content in a way that it's neither satirical, neither honorable. Uh, it's simply doubtful, uh, but yet staring at it. Uh, even though I find myself in this secular modern comfort, I also cannot deny a spiritual lens in my eyes. And this is what I would like to um, speak to you about. Um, 
I think as we know, um, the eyes activate art. Uh, art gets activated when we look at it and when the eyes are absorbing it. And uh, the more your eyes activate art, then also the more art itself activates the eyes for a big number of reasons. And I believe the same dynamic exists between the eyes and religion. Religion now definitely activates my eyes. And I think this is because my eyes activated many times religion. And I think this became kind of my crazy kink uh, in relation to my practice. Um, I started really thinking that uh, every belief firstly encounters the eyes as they are the main gate to reach the spirit. And for instance, in this digital collage that um, it's on the screen, the eyes were taken from El Greco paintings. And I remember, for instance, um, I was in New York because I had this crazy idea to immigrate to America and I was working illegally in a plastic factory for some time. And I remember going to this exhibition at the Met and I had never cried with a painting before, but this exhibition did get me very emotional and was really cathartic. And I remember thinking while looking at this beautiful painted eyes where you can almost see a white flame uh, inside them, uh, and all those eyes looking towards uh, the sky, that uh, the eye is the organ of light. Um, the eye is the organ that relates to light. And um, God uh, being the absence of darkness and almost like light itself, I thought um, the eyes need to be the place where God is within me. Um, and I think it's interesting when someone says, um, imagine this, imagine something for me. Normally people close their eyes in the action of imagination. And uh, so I think that opened eyes must be the opposite of that, must be to see and to believe, no imagination. Um, I kept on thinking about eyes and I also uh, got very excited by the fact that eyes are actually a part of your brain that stretches to the edge of the face. And uh, I started to be very interested in cliches like uh, the eyes are with the windows to the soul. But uh, what I wanted to kind of do with some of my work was to take this cliche to its extreme and to almost argument that uh, they are not the window to the soul, they are soul itself. Um, this is an installation I did back in 2018. Um, here we have some close-ups of two of the elements of this installation. Um, I made it with um, dry contact lens that were being penetrated by needles and um, hanged in this acrylic sheets. Um, here there's two other elements of the same installation. In one there's the figure of the cross made with candles. Uh, called Sensor, and the other one is uh, called Chalice, and it's this plastic cup shape um, joined with this um, reflective acrylic material as well. So um, I kept on thinking about eyes, and I do believe that eyes have spasms. I believe that eyes are detective sensitive to different la layers of reality, uh, and that they have a life of their own. I believe that eyes are also a two-way highway. Uh, they are not only the instrument by which the brain gets populated with images from the outside, but also how the outside too gets populated by the brain and by thoughts and all those uh, things that inhabit our mind like fears, etc. So the eyes are really for me a vehicle that infects the brain with the outside and also infects the outside with the brain. Uh, and I think this is also part of uh, how I uh, understand what happened with my grandmother. Um, and the more I was looking to these images of the interior of the eye, the more I felt like they were also so good at translating the idea of looking at the impossible or the forbidden or uh, picking up the veil of things, seeing what's on the backstage of reality. I think the iris itself is kind of like a curtain and um, 
I think when I look at these images, they are kind of pagan to look at it. It's kind of like a sacrilege to look at them because the interior of the eye should be exactly an, an accessible thing for you to look at. You could look at the interior of your hand, but not the interior of the eye. That's exactly the place where everything enters. Um, so it's like turning upside down the experience of being a human to be able to look inside. Um, so for me, it was a very heavily charged idea on shifting a perspective and ultra religious. Um, also, when I look at these images, they remind me of planets. Uh, and when I think about the pupil, it reminds me of a black hole. And I think that we, and of course our eyes, are uh, the universe experiencing itself. Um, we are not just experiencing the universe, but we are the universe experiencing itself. And um, God has to be that too, for me. Uh, we are God experiencing himself. Um, and I do feel like my eyes are a tool for that. Um, this six uh, digital collages were initially thought of as a series of tests of sculptures that I wanted to do in the future, in which I would place fundus photography, uh, which were also the same ones in the previous slide, and I would place them inside the monstrance, uh, which is actually a word that I like very much because it's a word that comes from a Latin word, which means to show. Um, so I wanted to place this images of the interior of the eye inside monstrances. And uh, I also find very uh, interesting the process of editing and doing these images because I was collecting uh, these two types of images, monstrances from religious websites and fundus photography from scientific websites. And I felt like uh, I was creating new meanings when merging these two images that kind of feel like two opposite uh, from two opposite sources. Um, I remember uh, starting to upload them online and uh, receiving messages from my family asking me to delete them, reasoning that uh, inside a monstrance should only be placed the body of God. Um, but I do think that they understood uh, these images at the same time because it is exactly because of that that I was placing uh, the eye inside it, because I believe God is particled and shared into each one's eyes interior. Um, and now I would like to uh, show one minute of a film that I did last year.
Thanks very much, David. Is that the end of the presentation? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. David. Um, the, um, so as I said before, please put um, questions in the chat for David. I will read them out. Um, before I do so, I'd just like to say, David, um, you know, in my introduction, I said you just graduated. And I think sometimes when, um, you know, when people hear that people have just graduated, apologies, this is my cat, he will be quiet in a minute. Um, when people hear that people have just graduated, you know, they assume there's a sort of starting out really, but, you know, clearly you have a very deeply considered, um, you know, body of work already behind you. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. I'm going to read out the, the um, comments we already have and questions we already have. Feel free to come back um, uh, and, and pick up any points you'd like to, um, knowing that we've only got a few minutes. So Adrian says, insight into connections, wonderful. Once I went to Lourdes, and you are right. Devotional trinkets, sex shop analogy, perfect. Patrika Bistrand said, asked a question, what about the blind? I guess in relation to um, your comments about eyes. Mm -hmm. Rosemary Cantwell said, thank you very much for inviting me. That was very powerful. And Maria says, hi, David. I really loved how you described previously being in church, thinking about sex, brackets, duality, and later in life being in these sexualized places, finding yourself thinking about religion. I think it speaks a lot to how religion and queerness slash sexuality already coexist inside us. Thank you for sharing your work and thinking. Many interesting connections. Rosemary Cantwell again, one humanity. Georgina Sleep, regarding the film, the choice of music was obviously crucial to the piece. What is it? Did you worry that its incredible beauty would emphasize the importance of our sense of hearing and the importance of music and religious feeling, which complicates your own emphasis on vision? And I think that Rachel's going to pick up on some of these uh, issues a bit later on, which is nice. Um, anyway, I'm going to stop there because uh, and give you a chance to respond, David, in whatever way you'd like. Thank you, everybody, for for your comments. Um, in relation to uh, uh, the question, what about the blind? Um, it's interesting. I do ask myself that question uh, every time I think about eyes, what about the blind? And uh, to be very honest, um, I have no idea uh, how someone uh, visually impaired would, um, would uh, deal with faith because I think for me, um, and maybe that's because, uh, fortunately, I always uh, was capable uh, of seeing. But for me, religious religion really uh, affects my eyes in a way that it doesn't affect me through. Um, like I, I do think about this many times. Like I don't know uh, if I can find the presence of God or the presence of faith in my brain or in my heart, uh, I don't know. But uh, I, th I think that I do find these things in my eyes. And um, so, yes, I, I do not know how to answer that question. Um, you and, might and, like, David, I, if I could read out, Sarah said, I was reading an essay re recently by a blind person reflecting on Genesis, book of Genesis, and the relationship between darkness and light. Your talk made me think about blindness also. The essay began to talk about darkness as a positive in scripture, where God, quote, wraps himself in darkness. Very interesting. Um, could, could you please write down which essay was it? Uh, if you can remember. Um, and also the, the one in relation to the importance of music in religious feeling. Um, I think it's uh, crucial and uh, it's incredible and uh, sound definitely plays a big, big part um, on it. But I think 
also uh, when I think about sound, I think about what sound does to my eyes. Uh, and most of the time I cannot, um, when I'm really inside sound or inside the music, uh, I feel like my eyes are as triggered as my ears are uh, whenever I, um, I am in that state. And um, also sound uh, makes me visualize things in the same way that, um, in the same way that sound is so important in relation to uh, empathizing feeling and um, I think the eyes as well do drink a lot from uh, from sound. That's uh, that's a very interesting you're touching on uh, synesthesia there and um, I'm reminded that um, you know the early uh, the early modernist abstract painters who were you know very informed by um, had a self self understanding, I guess, of, of of spirituality in their art. Were very uh, interested in in synesthesia, the crossover of the senses, mm -hmm. in that way. Um, yeah, we've got a couple more minutes, I think. Um, if anybody would like to just ask another question. Okay, so listen, thank you so much, David. Um, much appreciated. Um, and uh, others, oh, um, yeah, I just left the link to one of the videos that I speak of uh, in my presentation here, if anybody's interested in seeing. Thank you. So, everybody in the chat is the link to David's um, uh, work that he spoke about um, that is on the New Contemporaries platform. And just finally, Georgina. Sleep um, says the reverse is also true, I think. Um, I'm trying to learn Arabic. I live in Egypt and I've noticed that I find it almost impossible to keep a conversation going if I take my glasses off to clean them. Interesting. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we now um, move on. Our second presenter tonight is Helen Blechemann who is an artist and writer based in the UK, originally from Mexico City. She is an associate lecturer in the Department of Fine Art at Sheffield Hallam University, where she has also just begun a practice-based PhD with a scholarship from the Culture and Creativity Research Institute, exploring unidentified burials related to femicide in Mexico. Over to you, Helen. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you so much, Nina, Mark, and James, for, for the opportunity. I will share screen. This is a video uh, that shows the narrative behind my work, A Visual Theory of the Soul. At the beginning of lockdown, I found out about this stone. It was placed a few years ago in this large area covered only with grass behind Wadsley Churchyard in Sheffield, UK. The interns buried there had no gravestone and very likely were buried without a memorial. The South Yorkshire Asylum, a 15 minutes walk from the churchyard, admitted as well as mental health patients, groups of pauper people who were no longer able to work in the workhouses. As an artist, I wanted to work with this place. When I was a teenager, my own mother was diagnosed with messianic paranoia. What a profound way to learn the meaning of the word messianic. 
I suppose that pushed me into adulthood. This was Mexico in the 80s, 90s. I believe no one in our community knew anything about mental health. My mother spent a few months inside one of these asylums in Mexico. And she passed away one and a half years ago. The family, Jewish, buried her the same day. So when I arrived in Mexico from the UK three days later, I couldn't see her body. It wasn't there. But I could see her grave and the flowers of the weeds around it. A lot has been said about art in Western and Eastern philosophies, and a lot has been said about beauty, about the sublime. In his book, What is Art?, Tolstoy says that it is not as simple as it seems that making art is making beauty. We know that since Dadaism and Surrealism and other avant-garde intellectual art movements. Still, as an artist, my questions cannot escape the problems of beauty and the sublime. So, in order to make work about this space and these pauper souls with no memorial and no stone, I needed to ask some questions. Because the artist is not a priest, so the role is not to redeem. The artist cannot promise an eternal life in the most glorious circles of heaven. So who am I in front of these people? Who am I as Mexican? As Jewish? As the daughter of a woman who ended up with schizophrenia? whose body I didn't see before she was buried. Day one, I began my work opening a botanical logbook and recording the flowers of the weeds I found in the space. I believed that the bodies buried there had slowly turned into the soil and then into the flowers and into the birds and insects that fed on them. The Lebanese poet Hibran Halil Hibran, in his poem On Beauty, says, It is not the image you would see, nor the song you would hear, but rather a garden forever in bloom, and a flock of angels forever in flight. Where do we bury our mental bendings, our mental unresolved, our mental pauper souls, so to speak? How much do we use our obsessive language to hide our dead bodies? Does our mental unresolved deserve our awareness? Does it require our compassion? We can talk in terms of knowing. Now we know. And we all know that we all know. So there is no option but compassion, but repairing. Repairing with the other. With the other in our own selves, the stranger in ourselves. Strangers to ourselves, Julia Kristeva would say. When the family told me that my mother died, I arrived in Mexico to the Shibe, the seven days after burial, where the family and friends pray for the soul of the departed to be elevated. All the mirrors in my grandmother's house were covered with black cloth. They say, to avoid the soul who is still around us, seeing herself reflected with no body.
every morning at 7 a.m., we were at the synagogue. People were praying the El Malay Rahamim, the actual Jewish prayer for the dead, less well known than the Moner's Kaddish. Al Malay Rahamim, Shochayim Bameromim, Hamsei Menucha Nechona Al Kamfei, Ashechina Bemaalot Kedushim Uthorim, Kezoar Harakiya Mashirim. God, filled with mercy, dwelling in the heaven's heights, bring proper rest beneath the wings of your Shekhinah, illuminating like the brilliance of the skies the souls of our beloved and our blameless, who went to their eternal place of rest. May you, who are the source of mercy, shelter them beneath your wings eternally. And with my mother as well, I believed that her body will slowly turn into the soil and then into the flowers of the weeds and into the birds and insects that will feed on her. In Sheffield, I inspected each of the flowers of the weeds that grew behind Wadsley churchyard. I walked into my artist's studio and closed the door. I made eight large-scale drawings that depict what I believe to be the visual theory of each of the flower's eternal soul. And now I will share a sound piece, an echo of a visual theory of the soul. And both made last year in this, this sound piece. It was produced for the Being Human Festival of the Humanities. Welcome to the Being Human National Festival of the Humanities podcast, brought to you by the University of Sheffield. In this episode, Who Lies Beneath, Sheffield-based Mexican artist Helen Bledgerman introduces Soil and Soul, an ongoing knowledge exchange project in collaboration with Dr Julia Banwell. The project responds to the history of 2,500 pauper souls buried in a grassy area behind Wadsley Church Cemetery in Sheffield. Alejandra Pizarnik wrote, 
My words demand the silence of a wasteland. My name is Helen Bledgerman. I am a Mexican artist based in Sheffield, England. I'm interested in the idea of absence and in the fantasies and mythologies we produce there. I have worked investigating the absent body, the absent woman, and the invisible woman artist. However, now I would like to talk about life. More than life, about being alive. In the Jewish tradition, when someone dies, they are buried immediately, unless it is Shabbat, or a loved one who lives far away has to be waited for. When waiting is necessary, the body is covered, and the guardians take care of it at all times while they pray. When they see that the time has come, they take the body to the room where the washing is carried out as an act of purification. In this ritual, called in Hebrew the Tahara, they place the body face up on a table and the people of the Hebra Kadisha begin the prayers. While they wash the person, they avoid passing the soap from one hand to another over the body. To leave, they say, a free path to the soul in case it is emerging at that moment. And after the washing, everything is ready for the burial. We always knew that once the body is buried, it belongs to the worms. Even though above the ground where everyone is still alive, people sing the Kaddish prayer, helping the soul to rise to the most beautiful heavens. But nobody told us that it is the organisms inside the earth that would give the body true eternal freedom. A colony of worms fed by the tissue crawls inside the soil and when it starts to rain, they feel the vibration of the water like drums of war and go out into the open, as if responding to a call for life. They move forward following a power that gives them enough courage to enter the world. We always knew about the rain and its consequences, sometimes through the poets, we believe them, Angelou, Plath, Dickinson, Baudelaire, Rilke, Pisarnik when she wrote, Naked, dawn dreaming a solar night, I have laid animal days, wind and rain erased me like a fire, like a poem written on a wall. But above all, we learned about the rain by feeling it, by getting wet. When in the middle of the storm, we decided to stop running. I recently read that through its body, the earthworm makes the soil more nutritious, richer, more fertile. And then in that land, all the flora grows, as it does, quietly. And then... With the smallest ray of sunlight, in that layer of grass, flowers everywhere, in thousands of lands at the same time, without ceremony or prayer, the flowers that blossomed in the rich soil labored by the small organisms and minerals, the flowers. Lilium tulipa phalaenopsis, clavel alstroemeria chrysanthemus, Narciso, Elianthus, Gladiolo, Eucaris, Campanula, Moluchella, Trachelium, Gelebore, Celosia, Aquilegia, Echinacea, Buenocera, Solidago, Muscari, Nerine, Iris, Amarilis, Belladona, Lavandula, Limonium, Eustora, Helicona, Anthuirum, Paeonia, We knew about the flowers. 
Sometimes from the poets. Whitman, Inés de la Cruz, Tagore, Jalil Gibran, or Basho, when he visited the priest Ninko at the Saiganji Temple in the village of Fushimi. And he wrote, I picked my way through a mountain road and was greeted by a smiling violet. We knew this, but nobody told us that in hundreds of lands at the same time, butterflies arrive flying, ignoring everything about the individual life of the person there, under the earth, none of their fears, their dreams, desires. Butterflies fly in without knowing anything, feeling only an uncontrollable attraction for flowers for the vibration of their color, of their electromagnetic spectrum. And these bloom, then and there, without knowing anything about what happens underneath that soil fertilized by living organisms and minerals, here and now, at the same time in thousands of lands. All the butterflies fly in and then fly away to pollinate other flowers. No prayer told us that we, bodies under the earth, would be directly, biologically, the organism that creeps through the minerals that transmutes into flowers, that attract the butterflies with their life. Nobody told us that we would become the pollination of the natural order. No angel ceremony or prayer. The butterflies. Timelicus silvestris, Timelicus lineola, Timelicus acteon, Esperia coma o clode silvanus erinis tages, Pirgus malvae, Leptidea sinapis, Lisandra coridon, Lisandra velargus, Colias croseus, Gonepterix ramni, Calofris rubi, Neocephirus quercus, Satirium galbum, satirium pruni, licaena flaeas eleus. Cupido minimus flebellus argus, polimatus icarus. Pieris napi, pieris rapae, pieris brassicae. In one of his lectures at Harvard University, Borges quotes Zhuang Zhu when he said, quote, I dreamt that I was a butterfly, and when I woke up, I didn't know whether I was a man who had dreamt of being a butterfly or a butterfly who was now dreaming it was a man. We knew this, but no rabbi told us that then a flock of birds comes and catches the butterflies to then fly away to all their nests inside the canopy trees, shaking with the wind a wind produced by bodies buried underneath the soil, turned into minerals, transmuted into flowers, transformed into butterflies, turned into all the birds in the world, flying in freedom, while on land, the magnificent and small human prayer wants the soul to rise to eternal heavens. I will leave it there. And finally, I will share, and this is 40 seconds. Um, do I have time, Mark, James? One, yes, one, Helen, yes? you do, thank you. Thank you. So I will show you. Your showing of the drawings is a new Kaddish, very touching, and a strange and beautiful animism. Sasha Lee. Did you create a certain set of rules or language to the drawings you made inspired by the flowers? Where did the colors, forms, softness, harshness come from? Did you make them quickly and almost subconsciously or was it a long process? They remind me of Hilma af Klint's work. Uh, Milena Mikalski asks, can you please put a reference to that poem and text? Thank you. Adrian again, strangely for deeply Jewish thinking in rhythm as well as words, I think of the very Catholic Hopkins, Gerard Manley, 
as I listen. Nina, the Nino, in the image unmarked graves and fields, anonymity, genocide, is nature a healing aspect, memorializing or generalizing death into insects and flowers, etc. The sound, a description to the individual body and of the laying out and ritual. Uli says, the sound and the voice as a kind of liturgy. Suher, so is heaven not godly, but the earth in its regenerative mode? So lots to respond to there. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for the comments and questions. Um, the drawings are Scottish. Wow. <laughs> yes. Um, it's a shame that the video got out and I don't know if I, if I brought it back to the precise moment uh, where it stopped. Uh, but these 2,500 pauper people were buried there without a memorial in Victorian times. Uh, they were, they were um, inhabiting the South Yorkshire Asylum, but they were not, uh, they didn't have mental problems, only poverty, no? Uh, so for two, uh, for the person, uh, someone is asking also if the drawings were made quickly, unco unconsciously, uh, for, for two weeks, I decided to explore the grass area where these where these bodies are buried, uh, we, without a plaque. Um, so I opened a logbook, a botanical logbook, and I started uh, writing down the, the flowers I, and the weed that I found in the grass. Um, with this piece, I found the limit of art. The artist can only use their imagination to think about uh, the afterlife. Is where, is where um, I met my limit as an artist and my material. So the drawings are purely imagination, purely intuitive, um, and they are the soul of the flowers that I found in that, in that grass. Um, they, I, I made eight drawings in three months under lockdown uh, conditions. Uh, Nina, uh, nature, a healing as aspect, a healing aspect, absolutely. And also nature as in this, in this so obscure, unidentified uh, burial site situation, a uh, genocide, um, yes, in a sense, I think so. In a sense, yes. And I, I thought that hundreds of years after the event of bearing, it would be interesting to see what the bodies are still producing in terms of life. Uh, um, in, the, in the biological cycle of life is where I really see the eternal, the eternal living. Beyond the beyond beyond the human prayer. I'll leave it there. Um, I should have mentioned earlier that we, as well as putting comments in the chat, which you can do at any time, and thank you for doing that. It's really helpful um, having them, you know, when when they're fresh in your mind. Um, we do also in this section, uh, the Q&A section, we do invite people to put their hands up and uh, James will um, keep an eye out for who's got their hands up. Um, so if you prefer to, to, to ask a question or make a comment, in fact, um, sort of verbally rather than, than typing it in, please feel free to do that. I'm sorry I didn't mention that before. Um, I would like to ask Milena which, which of the poems she refers to. And, and I can put the reference. The one with the flowers, I meant. Um, the one, sorry, I'm connecting my videos. Yeah, the one with the flowers I was thinking of that you did um, in two languages. Um, was particularly, yeah, uh, striking. Uh, it's, it, it's not a poem. I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned it. Is the name of the flowers in Latin? So that's what I wondered if you'd just done that yourself and you'd created almost like a kind of a poem with it. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And also the butterflies <laughs> is the scientific name in Latin.
Um, if I could just pick up on a question someone asked, um, oh, actually it was a comment at the end of their question actually, yes, uh, mentioning Hilma F. Clint, who of course was a pre predated or pre yeah um, predated um, the the kind of um, more canonical, should we say, um, abstract painters like Kandinsky, Mondrian, etc. But uh, like them, she was very influenced by theosophy um, and these nineteenth-century kind of quasi quasi religious, quasi scientific, um, you know. Um, programs and, and I just wonder whether you whether you and 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 your work is clearly cognizant of that work and so I just wondered whether you might be able to say something about um the relationship between that phenomenon which was so influential on on modern art and uh, Judaism which is not usually mentioned oh how interesting uh, like that without thinking too much about it I I aesthetically I would think that her drawings are similar to the mystic aesthetics of, the, uh, of Judaism, mainly the images we see in the Kabbalah. Mm -hmm. um, and it's one of the differences between her work and, and, and my work. Um, as we know, she had this group, esoteric group that met regularly. And uh, some say that, um, she asked for her work not to be seen for several years after her death, which I find very interesting. And also apparently um, some of her works were dictated by angels. So it's clearly esoteric. Um, I try to ground my work in biology, <laughs> uh, contrast, contrasted to uh, culturally what we know about religion actually only culturally uh, i love i love hilma of work i do love her work and she was a pioneer and she worked uh, be, uh, ahead her time thank you um adrian has his hand up let me can you hear we can um yes now that that, that question which was just raised and you aren't, I mean, let me say that presentation was simply wonderful. I'm uh, quite stricken by it really. But um, the thing about the last question is that in, in my knowledge, which is now a bit rusty of those, generally speaking, that group of artists who are working from that kind of spiritual imagery is that it was profoundly Aryan in its thinking and maybe therefore something which one could think of as deeply incompatible with Semitic cultures. So I, I, I think that that's the kind of problem between what we might be moved by as images and what we might find in the terms we're all using it spiritually important. Um, that, that's all, I, I just was slightly tr troubled by that and um, mm how one handles that kind of question, because it's not unrelated to the question of, in the first presentation, the extent to which these sex spaces and dark places of gay culture are also profoundly devotional. You know, so how, Adrian, how do we put this together? That's all. Adrian, can I just clarify, by Aryan, do you mean in its sort of classical sense of Indian roots, or do you mean in the sort of Nazi appropriation? I, 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 mean, I mean in, in its classical sense of Indian roots. And the relation of that to a particular language, which is Hindi, mm -hmm. which is not a Semitic language. So that enters into the early reception of Tagore, for example. Those people adored Tagore, actually because he wasn't Semitic. You know, though he separated himself from that and he wrote both ways around in Hindi and in, the Arabic, in, in Arabizing languages. So I, I mean, in that in that um, generic sense, that notion of Indian Aryan, the Indo-European, as being one of the long-term axes of the exclusion of the Semitic, mm. whether Arab or Jewish. I'm sorry, but that's not the subject. I don't want to trap you into that. I'm well, sorry. I, as the host tonight, I will. I will. Um, I, I would. I would say it's. It's. Um, 
Uh, perhaps we could put a marker down, Adrian, mm. and perhaps you might like to come speak in another session, yeah. a future session on that subject. But I think it's, it, sounds, uh, it sounds like there's um, a lot to say about it. Um, and I'd certainly like to hear more. However, um, forgive me for moving on to myself. <laughs> it feels very Please. odd. <laughs> but Helen, uh, thank you so much. Um, mm. And just to remind everybody, um, I think every yes, I think everybody, um, uh, David, Helen, and Rachel Tecum's websites are well, links to their websites are on our website. Also, um, we David's put a link in into the chat, um, and I think someone's asked Helen for a link as well. So please do feel uh, free to follow follow up um, on on the uh, artists you've heard speaking. So um, <laughs> I now have a slightly odd um, task of introducing myself. Before I do that, I need to share my screen. Um, let's see if I can get this right. Okay, everybody can see that. James, can we see that? Yeah, we can see it, and yeah, you're doing that perfect. Okay, get rid of that. Okay, so um, yes, it seems a little odd to now be in. Actually, sorry, I'm going to just play this first. Beg your pardon. It seems a little odd to now be introducing myself as a presenter in this forum, which I set up with Nina because I'm interested in hearing how others experience living with the questions of religion and art. I say living because although I've been asking such questions myself for a long time now, I still have no real answers apart from the practice of religion and the practice of art, sometimes in the same breath. In the languages of the Bible, Hebrew and Greek, the word for breath, ruach and pneuma respectively, is also the word that is translated as spirit. This notion of living with the questions is taken from Rilke, who wrote in one of his letters to a young poet, do not search for answers, live the questions now, then perhaps someday far in the future, you will gradually, without even noticing it, live your way into the answer. Speaking now as an old poet of sorts, I've found the process to be more fractious. It hasn't felt gradual so much as halting. And rather than not noticing it, it's been hard to stop thinking about it. I used to think this was somehow my fault, but now I just think that the relation between art and religion is a particularly difficult question and therefore living it will be difficult. Of course it is. Art is difficult and religion is difficult. So together they're going to be even more difficult. But separating them is not the answer. I once gave a talk on art and religion to a group of newly arrived fine art students as a chaplain. And one of them said to me, I don't understand how you can be an artist 
and a priest, because art is about freedom and religion is about doing what you're told. That's the problem with trying to deal with questions like these in any way other than through lived practice. The answers just generate more questions. Like, art is about freedom. Really? What kind of art might we be talking about here? And what kind of freedom? Not to mention what kind of religion? So for the purposes of this presentation, I thought I would limit my inquiry to just one work, documentation of which you're looking at now, which, is, which I've been living with for most of the time I've been thinking about questions of religion and art. I made this work, which is actually a video projection, entitled Nothing to Worry About, brackets, Easy Rider slash Frenzy minus three, in 1995, the same year that I was confirmed as a Christian, and it was exhibited in my first solo show. Seen today, the religious content of the work is fairly obvious. There is a repetition of the phrase, I believe in God. And later, although you haven't heard it because I turned the sound down, there is a recitation of lines from Psalm 91. You will not fear the terror of the night or the arrow that flies by day or the pestilence that stalks in darkness or the destruction that wastes at noonday. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. So if I presented this to you as a work of religious art or even an icon, perhaps you might accept it as such. However, when it was first shown, it passed as an example of 90s young British art, as evidenced by this Time Out review of the show by Martin Herbert, which I thought I'd read out as it seems to skirt around the subject of religion. Dennis Hopper is cheering himself up. There is nothing to fear but fear himself. Sorry, there is nothing to fear but fear itself, he quotes endlessly into a tape recorder. The scene, five seconds from Vin Vendor's film, The American Friend, has been transferred to a video loop and is in turn slowed and speeded up to transform Hopper's mood from growling determination to chipmunk optimism and back again. Mark Dean's sharp video and sound works are concerned with reactions to life's scary incoherence. In the next room, another stammering screen plays a multi-speed loop from Vendor's film, Alice in the Cities, whose male protagonist similarly murmurs, I'm afraid of fear. Horror breeding horror. This is the optimism of, of Beckett. The scene is bracketed by symbolic frames of a bath filling and emptying down a plug hole, reminiscent of a scene in Psycho. And sure enough, Hitchcock lurks downstairs. An audio excerpt from his infamously nasty film, Frenzy, plays over a clip from Hopper's Easy Rider. On screen, a woman repeatedly mouths a phrase, a protective mantra against disappointment. In this case, a sense of hope of overcoming glimmers through. It's the strongest piece here, an impressively poetic radical reshaping of the source material. As the characters enact their reassurance rituals, we have to wonder whether it's really for the best. Perhaps like Dean's judicious editing, they are merely blocking out sight of the bigger picture. For, for tonight's presentation, I deliberately turned down the sound before the central section of this work, which contains the audio taken from the rape and murder scene in Frenzy. I've come to understand that I need to be careful how I show this work because it seems to affect different people in different ways. The year after it was first exhibited at City Racing in London, it was shown at Bricks and Kicks in Vienna and again in London in a survey show at the ICA in 2001. And I'm not aware of anyone objecting to it. But about 10 years later, sorry, 10 years ago, which was 10 years later, I presented it to a group of postgraduate students in Oxford who identified as Christians. They were not art students, but they were interested in the arts and had invited me to talk to them about my work as an artist and newly ordained priest. After the screening, one of them physically wagged their finger at me and said I should turn to Christ. They said they did not want to see things like that and they did not want their children to see them either, at which their partner nodded in agreement. I could have argued that firstly, I had already turned to Christ, thank you very much. Secondly, 
all they had seen on screen was a person reciting the first line of the creed. And thirdly, their children were not in the audience and I wasn't planning to invade their home and expose them to my work. But I didn't argue because I realized that the content of the work, sorry, the context, I realized that the context of the work had shifted since I had made it and I needed to try to understand how. I thought maybe it was because they were a religious audience more than an art audience. Although I should also say that not everyone present took the same view of the work as this couple. It's an unfortunate fact that a small number of Christians claim to speak on behalf of all Christians, of Christ even, and they tend to be the most vocal and judgmental. But a year or so later, I showed the same work to another group of postgraduate students who were studying fine art and who had not declared any religious affiliation. One of these got very angry and upset with me for showing this work, saying that it was irresponsible to have done so as it was triggering. I can understand this, which is why I'm more careful where and how I show it these days. Although if you would like to watch and hear it in full, documentation is available on my website and I'll put the link in the chat. I think there are three problems with this work. And by problems, I mean questions, not necessarily faults. Firstly, and obviously it references rape, which despite its prevalence as a subject in art history is problematic by definition and perhaps has become a more sensitive issue since this work was made. Am I qualified to make artwork about rape? I hope my work was not insensitive to the feelings around the subject, although I recognize that they are not easy. The second problem is that the protagonist in the original film footage is female. Am I qualified to make such an appropriation? Conscious of this question, I lowered the pitch of the audio taken from the rape scene in Frenzy in order to masculinize the subject. The relationship of the film's image to the film's sound is therefore ambiguous. And this ambiguity may also be present in the relationship of the protagonist to the author of the work. I had learned to distance myself from my work in this way after making my first video, which used home movie footage of myself as a child. This work happened to get written about in the national press where the re reviewers referenced sexual abuse. Although I had not spoken about it publicly, it was true that I had been sexually abused as a child and the work was dealing with this at some level, but the person who abused me was not a member of my family. And in any case, the work was not intended to be read as simply autobiographical. This was one reason I began using footage from other people's films. But when I appropriated representations of female characters, which I do for a complexity of reasons, I was aware that there was the potential for the work to be read as objectifying. And this concerned me, although not enough to stop me making the work. Art is about freedom after all. I was eventually reassured when Rachel Withers wrote in Art Forum in reference to a text for a retrospective of my work, briefly alluded to is the artist's childhood experience of rape a shocking detail that suggests a searing therapeutic dimension in certain works. Going back, The Bird Slash the Birds times 32 plus one, 1997, manipulates Hitchcock footage of a bloodied collapsed tippy hedron, shifting her back and forth from wide-eyed dreamy repose to terror as she fights off Hitchcock's attacking lens. On the soundtrack, a repeated line from a pretty bird's tune sings of going back, a paradoxically soothing reference to, in Dean's words, the recovery of traumatic memory. Hedron becomes a surrogate for the artist in a nuanced and moving moment of cross-gender identification. I'm aware that this too might provoke finger wagging as some Christians claim that God created life on a male and female binary, and this naturally determines the way we should live today. To my mind, this seems a fundamentally pagan idea rather than Christian. I refer to the words of St. Paul in his letter to the Galatians, which say, 
There is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. This brings me to the third problem with this work, which is its religious content. What constitutes this content and who decides? I suppose if, like tonight, I had only shown the first part of the work to the finger-wagging Christians, they would not have objected. I trust that the statement, I believe in God, would have been acceptable to them. So it seems that the other part of the work, the audio representation of rape, was somehow considered irreligious. But in what way? Was I glorifying sexual violence? Even the person who felt triggered by the work did not accuse me of this. So was it a more aesthetic kind of sensitivity? Some people view both art and religion as abstract ideals, art as spirituality and spirituality as ethereality. But I suspect that this was not the case here. As culturally sophisticated postgraduate students, they would not have been shocked by the idea of rape as a subject in art, and as committed Christians, they would presumably have agreed that religion is about dealing with real life. I think there was a deeper issue with the narrative content of the work, whereby the protagonist calls on God to help her, but is killed nonetheless. A belief in God continues, and so to those who have ears, perhaps, a sense of hope of overcoming glimmers through. But is this enough? There is a story in Luke's gospel of a time when Jesus preached in his own hometown and, quote, all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. And he said, truly, I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up for three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the project, prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff but he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. The usual interpretation of this story is that the people became angry because Jesus was suggesting that God can cared for Gentiles at least as much as for Jewish people. But I'm not convinced that would account for them going from speaking well of him to trying to murder him. I suspect that what really drove people mad was being reminded that while God can save and heal, people still get sick and die, or get raped and murdered. Are we only willing to believe and trust in God so long as such things will not happen to us? Of course, we don't care to admit that our faith is so conditional, and neither do we dare to admit we are angry at God for allowing such things to happen, but we have to blame someone. So shoot the messenger. I said that art is difficult and religion is difficult, but the truth is life is difficult, sometimes very difficult, scarily incoherent even. And so, yes, we do need our reassurance rituals, which sometimes take the form of art and sometimes religion. And maybe in that sense, at least, they are not so far apart. Thank you, me. <laughs> Thank you for listening to me. Um, please, as ever, put your comments in the chat or put your hands up. I will read out. So Adrian Ruach in the first line, by the way, Helen, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Ruach. Thank you very much. In the first lines of Genesis, if feminine, Sorry, let me read that again. Ruach in the first lines of Genesis, if feminine, and that has a relation to this elegant 
Oh, sorry, I must mean is feminine. Sorry, thank you, Adrian. Ruach in the first lines of Genesis is feminine, and that has a relation to this elegant and intricate exploration. Thank you very much. Helen said powerful work and presentation. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Helen. Nina, thank you. <laughs> this, is, this is quite circular. Um, anyway, thank you for listening, everybody. Um, I'm going to stop reading out the thank yous, but I just thank you for thanking me, everybody. Um, but um, if you have any questions, please ask. Otherwise, we can um, move on, and um, uh, which will give us more time for um, questions to the other artists, which I'd be very happy um, to do. So, oh, thank Adrian you, put his hand up. Welcome. Thank you, James. Thank you. I just, I just want to say that that. Um, um, I, I, I just spent a bit of time beginning to study the Lurian Kabbalists of Safet in the early, in the mid sixth century, and their de-gendering, specific gendering relationships of, of the men of a man and woman is so radical that it is reading now in terms of all our preoccupations with what gender, and what point in their lives. And there's a, a, a formula which one of them came up with, which is until the expulsion from paradise decided, we knew this, we everyone knew it. Adam thought of being God's wife. So I think when the people come up with the, as he made them. Sorry, I'm sorry, Adrian. Is it just, can I just check? Is it just me or, or is, so, is, is Adrian's sound so breaking up? Uh, there's a problem with the audio here. Oh, I'm so sorry. I have, I have either seen Britain right now, maybe it's a sound problem. Um, maybe if, maybe if, if you wouldn't mind reverting to the text, so sorry about that. Um, but it, 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 we, we, it was... Um, it was I, I, I'll revert and you carry on with this to be in that case. Um, I'm, I'm just going to read out some more of the texts. Um, Holly Slingsby, is appropriation of visual cinematic material in any way analogous to responding to bi biblical texts, i.e. taking something pre-existing and re reframing it to expose new meaning? Sarah White, while listening to the video play, I heard the phrase, I'm sorry, in the background behind the phrase, I believe in God, but I must have been mishearing it. But in light of what you said, that hearing was quite strange. Yes, there is a, um, well, I can answer both those questions, maybe in, or not answer them, sorry, it's a silly thing to say. I can address those two questions uh, by saying that, yes, repetition is clearly very um, much part of religion. Um, so, um, and the new meaning, repetition exposes new meaning, basically. Otherwise, there's no point in it. Okay, and um, I sometimes wish people who quote the Bible endlessly would uh, would think a bit more about that fact. But anyway, um, when uh, when we listen to things repeated, um, we hear new things. And in that piece, um, we I hear um, I hear I hear I hear the word hysterical being repeated. Uh, when it was first shown, um, one of the curators heard, I'm a bleeding dog. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, you can hear all sorts of things um, in it. Um, Ian Andrews, Mark, I wanted to ask how important it is to you that you use pre-existing film samples in your work. Do, you, do I, I do use, yes, Ian, I do use footage that I shoot myself less often, um, but I do. Um, if you... My website, tailbiter.com, um, has some examples. Um, I'd be happy to direct you to them if you drop me a line. Um, Moran. Hello, Moran. One of our first presenters. Thank you for your presentation, Mark. Um, honest, full of faith and artistic. Thank you very much. All I can think about is blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven from the Beatitudes. 
Thank you for that. Um, I yes, well, thank you, thank you all for for um, your your positive feedback. It's it's um, you know, as I just shared, you know, I I, I don't always get um, positive feedback for my work, and that's fine. You know, that's fine. I'm not going to make it to be liked or anything like that. But um, uh, but it's um, it's it's gratifying to know that um, that it does connect um, with people. Ah, oh, Adrian, thank you. Um, so Adrian's uh, written a text in the 16th century, Safed Kabbalah, sorry, in the 16th century, Safed Kabbalah, Adam is God's wife. Wow. Gender follows the fall, not precedes it, mm -hmm. and depends on the individual soul, not the body. Very interesting. I mean, Adrian, thank you for that. And I think that, you know, so much work needs to be done on this question of gender. I mean, because it's, it's used to, as I alluded as I referred to in my text you know very just touched on it but um it's, it's you know I'm, I'm actually I could talk a long time about it um but uh you know it's used to fundamentally oppress people um in the most awful way by uh by religious people and um you know it, it's it's a particular interpretation of texts, certain texts that leads to this conclusion, but there are many other interpretations um, which are not, which do not require, in my, in my view, do not require us to just kind of not, not um, view scripture as um, something that is, that is uh, not infinitely labile, but actually has a God-given meaning, okay? doesn't it, it it doesn't require us to not take it seriously in that regard but for example i'll just use one example from christian um in, from the new testament you know when jesus is is being asked about the resurrection he says you do not understand the scriptures you're wrong because you do not understand the scriptures in in the resurrection i in heaven um, people are not given in marriage, do not marry one another, but they are like the angels in heaven. And so, you know, clearly this notion of, of gender being the sort of basic building, the basic foundation of, of, of life and therefore of eternal life, which is the kind of life that really matters, I think, um, is clearly put into question by by Jesus his statement there um, but uh, you know I mean it's another question and, and I shouldn't I don't I can't go into it now but um, you know I am a, I am a priest in the Church of England and you know very unfortunate at the moment the Church of England denies the sacrament of marriage to the people of the same sex who want to get married which to me is a, is a travesty. However, we are straying, I am, I am straying from our subject. I will stop. Um, I'm sure my, I think my time is up. Thank you so much um, for all your um, questions and comments. And now it is my very great privilege to introduce Rachel Coombs, who is a doctoral candidate in history of art at St. John's College, University of Oxford where she's undertaking research on the decorative work of the Catholic painter, Maurice Denis. Rachel also has an undergraduate degree in music and is broadly interested in the intersection of religion, music, and the visual arts, particularly within the fractious culture of early 20th century France. So over to you, Rachel, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, can you all see my screen? Okay. It's all, yeah, lovely. Um, thank you to Mark and to Nina for giving me the chance to share my ideas and also to James for uh, your assistance with the tech side of things. So I want to begin with a, a more general consideration of the ways in which musical traditions, the visual arts and religious worship can productively interact. I want to do so by looking at a few examples that have piqued my own interest outside of my PhD. 
I'm not a practicing artist myself, so I can't offer the rich personal material practice that has been so central to these forum discussions so far. But I'm keenly interested, interested in the way that cultural traditions, such as I'll show tonight, continue to reassert themselves across the centuries and into our own time. I want to begin with this mosaic fragment, which dates back to the sixth century and was discovered in a synagogue in Gaza. The boyish looking musician is dressed as a Byzantine emperor. He is labeled as David and is shown playing a 14 stringed lyre. The fingers of his left hand rest lightly on the strings as he strikes them with a small hammer in his right hand. The directional gesture of both his arms invites us to discern the most prominent member of his immediate audience, a lion cub or perhaps a lioness. The creature appears in accordance with the legend of Orpheus to be bowing his head in docile submission to the music. In the early Byzantine era, it was not uncommon for Jews and Christians to appropriate imagery of Greco-Roman gods, as this mosaic of King David in the guise of Orpheus demonstrates. The synagogue community of Gaza would have been accustomed to Hellenistic imagery. The compelling parallel between the psalmist who drives out King Saul's demon with his playing and the Greek hero who tamed wild beasts through his song, probably made this syncretic image type a particularly popular choice. For the synagogue worshippers, King David was a preeminent biblical, the preeminent biblical musician, his identity being so intimately tied to the book of Psalms. Set within the floor of the synagogue, this mosaic is an emblematic prompt for worshippers to praise God through music in his sanctuary to use the phrase from Psalm 150. Just as King David's musicianship inspired the temple's priests to perform the original Psalms, so the Byzantine depiction of a performing David within the walls of the synagogue could act as an inspiration for music making to later generations. The Psalms poetic structures indicate their origin as songs and made them attractive to composers in the centuries to follow. J.S. Bach being perhaps the most obvious example. And this work here by the Greek Italian artist Yanis Kunelis is a powerful homage, not just to Bach, but to something at the heart of many of the Psalms. And that is the invitation to take up music to praise God. How so? Before the viewer is drawn to deciphering the musical score printed on the canvas of this work, we notice the adjacent empty chair. The lack of occupant is significant, I think, acting as a sort of imperative to the viewer. Once we discern the notation imprinted on the green-blue background, a fragment of Bach's St. John's Passion, the chair seems to take on added import, perhaps functioning as a trace of musical performance. Indeed, when this work was first displayed at the Modern Art Agency in Naples, a cellist occupied the chair, playing the printed musical fragment over and over again. Sing to the Lord a new song, commands the psalmist in Psalm 149. Cunellis's empty chair also functions as a kind of command. The work lies dormant until activated by the beholder. Thus it seems to invite new and endless completions. The Psalms are like that too, continually awaiting new voices to give them utterance in fresh configurations, styles and contexts. There are, of course, thousands of depictions in the art historical tradition of people making music in religious contexts. Just a few here. But what has interested me specifically in terms of my own thesis research is the way in which musicians and visual artists have sometimes found equivalences in their respective media for religious expression. And so for the remainder of this talk, I want to give you an insight into how this happened in the particular period in French culture that forms the focus of my doctoral project. The turbulent relationship between the state and the church at the turn of the 20th century in France had a catalytic effect on the country's Catholic cultural life. By 1905, the French Republic's commitment to de-Christianization led to the law of separation, establishing state secularism. Resentment felt by Catholics to this move inevitably engendered fierce debate as to the future place of the church within the fabric of France's social life. 
Among French artists, writers, and musicians, there was a desire to find novel artistic means that paid homage to past religious cultural impetuses, but that might also be appreciated by a modern audience. And I'm particularly interested in two interrelated figures within this so-called neo-Catholic movement. The composer Vincent Dandy on the left and his close friend, the post-impressionist painter, Maurice Denis. Neither composer nor painter distinguished their aesthetic from their ideological beliefs. And they both quickly be became figureheads for the Catholic revival revivalist movement, producing music and art infused with traces of medieval reinvention, as I'll show. In 1886, Denis writes in an early journal entry, painting is mainly a religious and Christian art. If that character faded during the impious century we live in, we must find it again. And the means for doing that is to make it a point of honor to reestablish the aesthetic of Fra Angelico, the only one true Catholic. His almost obsessive admiration for, uh, for the late medieval early Renaissance Italian painter Fra Angelico remained steadfast throughout his life. For Denis, the work of this so-called primitif painter embodied the epitome of what he termed the religious sentiment in art. Importantly, however, he maintained that this sentiment had little to do with the professed faith of the artist or, or indeed the subject matter of the work itself, but was instead demonstrated by the approach to the non-naturalistic rendering of nature which Denis himself describes as gaucherie, which is usually translated as clumsiness or awkwardness. He claims that primitive painters, such as Giotto and Fra Angelico, were able to preserve the sense of objects in a way that modern painters, clouded by their knowledge of painterly conventions and the search for the picturesque, could not. However spurious we might find Denis' vision of the unencumbered primitive artist, living in naive awe of the world around him and oblivious to the tyranny of the formulas of academicism. It was an ideal that strongly and consistently underpinned his sense of the religious. This search for the essence of things, not the plain reportage of nature, but the non-illusionistic rendering of the natural world in accordance with one's immediate response to it, was a central thread running through the symbolist thought of the post-impressionist group of painters known as the Nabi, uh, which means prophet in Hebrew, I believe. Of which he was a member. 1896 essay, Notes on Religious Painting, and I quote, all masterpieces are symbolist. And, symbolis and symbolism is a Christian theory. Artists, he believed, should be humble in response to the natural world without submitting to a knowledge of what things should look like. The connection he makes in much of his writing between religious character and subservience to the natural world is an elaboration of one of his widely used aphorisms, art is the sanctification of nature. Now let's look at some work. Properly. Denis' earliest paintings demonstrate certain properties that he associated with the primitive aesthetic, absorbed within the decorative synthetism so favored by the Nabis. Here is Pathway Through the, in, through the Trees in the Trees from 1891. The theme of the forest path appears frequently in his work as a visual metaphor for the progression of the soul towards religious enlightenment achieved through a life sustained by faith and prayer. Through the powerful movement into the depth of the fictive space, Denis emphasizes the experience of the walker on that long winding spiritual journey. The elongated bare tree trunks on either side of the sinuous track dwarf the human figures, suggesting man's humility in relation to the natural world, an attitude that he found so powerfully evoked in Quattrocento art. Denis' belief that art is the sanctifi san sanctification of nature reveals itself in perhaps more obvious ways in other works. He often played with the unambiguous transferal of biblical narratives to contemporary scenes of rural France, realizing a pictorial association between faith and the French countryside. Here, for example, is baby Jesus in the greenery 
I think there's probably a more elegant translation of that, which locates the newborn Christ in a verdant sunny copse. Clearly the distant houses and the attire of the women on the right all point to the scene being in modern day rural France. The green, black and soft pink hues of their clothing and skin are picked up strongly by the surrounding vegetation, enhancing an impression of the integration of sacred events with, within the French countryside, a place saturated in Denis' mind by the faith of its people. In other paintings, he inserts members of his own family or friends within contemporized biblical scenes. In this Descent from the Cross, we can make out Denis himself carefully removing nails from the cross in the left-hand corner, stripped to the waist to reveal a somewhat overly flattering muscular form. Although these last two works demonstrate a move away from the highly decorative stylization of his earliest paintings towards a more classicized aesthetic, we can nonetheless trace in the radical simplification of forms, a redevelopment of the primitive model. Denis' receptiveness to the aesthetic of pre-Renaissance artists is equally, if not more apparent, in his woodcut designs for book illustrations. The contingent requirements of the medium for simplification and elimination of extraneous detail serve Denis' purpose of distilling nature into its essential elements. Over his lifetime, he completed over 50 illustration projects, but his first venture into the field came at the age of 19, with his designs for Paul Verlaine's poetry collection, Sagesse, which translates as wisdom. And this, uh, this book of poetry is an exploration of the poet's Catholic childhood. The title of Verlaine's collection, Wisdom, belies the fact that a thread of childlike wonder weaves itself through the poems. The transfiguration through the simplified forms and icons of the poet's innocent explorations of his faith was surely one of the most powerful expressions of Denis' religious symbolism. What is more, the refashioning of medieval primitivism and its re-theorizing in symbolist terms allowed Denis to be guided by an artistic tradition, the woodcut, which was firmly associated with a religious past. So here on the screen here is his illustration for Velen's poem, Give Them Silence and Mysterious Love in which the kneeling communicants shrouded in white seem to be an exteriorization of a personal vision that the painter noted in one of his most effusively votive journal entries from 1889, following Holy, Communican, uh, Holy Communion. And he writes, this is my great dream to be in the heart of the mystery and the serenity of the temple, white things, waves, beautiful things, very elevated music. Now we might conjecture that this elevated music was liturgical chant, the revival of which Denis became actively involved with at the turn of the century. Not only did he frequently attend liturgical choral performances, but he was closely involved in a musical circle on his doorstep in the Paris suburb of Saint-Germain-en-Laye, which was devoted to the promotion of Gregorian chant, that is single line liturgical chant from the Middle Ages. Maurice Denis' sensitivity to and, and appreciation of music has been considered largely in isolation from other aspects of his artistic character. But his relationship with these Catholic musicians is, is of great importance to his self-identification. Like himself, they rejected the pervading fin de siècle culture of artistic individualism, which they claimed threatened cultural continuity. As I have mentioned, Denis found a particular affinity with the composer Vincent Dandy and vice versa. Dandy's lofty musical philosophy accorded with Denis' belief in the artist's glorious and necessary servitude to God. That's a quotation. In the first volume of Dandy's immense historical work, Lessons in Musical Composition, Dandy writes, is not the principle of all art of a purely religious nature and was not the first musical, <clears throat> excuse me, and was not the first musical manifestation, a prayer, a sacred song. He believed firmly that the contours of Gregorian chant could renew the melodic dimension of modern symphonic and operatic composition. Religious music was not to be treated as an archeological artifact. Instead, tradition must inform the present. His own music, 
which hovers between late romanticism and modernist idioms, is replete with melodies drawn from Gregorian chant. All four of his operas use melodies based upon specific chants, and his symphonic output is no less reliant on chant for its melodic inspiration. Um, and I've just got a quick example here. I won't uh, go too much in depth. Um, so this is Dandy's Summer Day in the Mountain from 1905. It's a so-called symphonic, symphonic triptych, inspired by the landscape of Dandy's birthplace in southern France. It consists of three movements, dawn, afternoon under the pines, and evening. Interestingly, the composer described the triptych form as being the only true national form. Presumably, he saw his country's religious heritage reflected in Trinitarian symbolism. The principal theme of the work's final movement highlighted here is based upon the Vespers Antiphon Virgo Prudentissima, which Dandy had discovered in a Benedictine choral book published in 1897. Um, now, if this works, I've just, I couldn't find a decent recording, so this is me doing a terrible job on the piano. Um, and as you can see here in the uh, original antiphon, it's sort of the same, exactly the same melodic outline, but just in neumes. Um, so if you can imagine this music, the boisterous opening section of this movement is disrupted by the solemn intoning of this liturgical melody by the corps anglais and the violas in unison. An audience may not have recognized the specific antiphon on which the phrase is based, but the modal inflection of the melody and the sudden condensing of orchestral texture transports the listener to a sound world evocative of the sobriety of religious ritual. What we find in this musical passage, as in so much of Dandy's music, is a religious musical form stripped of its sacred signifiers. There are no voices to sing liturgical text, and the work is, on the face of it, secular. In fact, Dandy integrates the melodic contours of the chant in much the same way as he incorporates themes derived from his beloved French folk songs. Perhaps we might regard this as a deliberate oral equating of the sacred and the pastoral. As the title indicates, A Summer Day in the Mountain, the work is a pie end to the natural world that has drawn comparisons with Richard Strauss's far better known tone poem, Alpine Symphony, composed a decade later. But while Strauss's work is a kind of musical homage to the Nietzschean Ubermensch's ability to reach metaphorical summits, Dandy's work is a revelation of God's creation. The walk in the mountains constitutes an act of adoration itself. In this work, and in others on similarly pastoral themes, Dandy implicitly draws a connection between the natural world and a religious musical world. We might understand this as a playing out in musical terms of Maurice Denis' motto, art is the sanctification of nature. Moreover, this is achieved through the embracing of medieval musical syntax, just as the character of Denis' work is informed by what he understood to be attributes of the primitive mentality. I want to finish with a brief mention of the teaching institutions that Denis and Dandy established as formalizations of their respective beliefs. Oh, sorry, you don't want that again. <laughs> Um, these places, they hoped, would act as sites of cultural dissemination, producing a new generation of musicians and artists committed to uniting the religious with the aesthetic experience. Described somewhat paradoxically by the musicologist Catherine Ellis as Paris's most radical school of music, Dandy's Schola Cantorum, pictured here, was set up in 1894 with the express purpose of teaching and performing religious music throughout France. In his inaugural speech, Dandy declared, since, since it is an established fact that the principle of any art form, be it painting, architecture, or music, is religious in nature, students will have much to gain through exposure to beautiful works from these historical periods of belief. In his own inaugural speech in 1896, the Scola's first president emphasized the familial ethos of the institution setting out his desire for a close apprentice-style relationship between master and student. 
With the system, he writes, we hope to produce modest but confident workers, not greedy souls and dried fruit. This philosophy of humility was to be directly echoed by Denis as he embarked on setting up his own institution, the Atelier d'Art Sacré, with the painter Georges de Vallier in 1919. The primary objectives of Denis and de Vallier were as follows. To train artists and craftspeople in the practice of Christian art, while also providing churches with religious works of an aesthetic, traditional and modern character. The balancing of tradition and modernity was a comparable challenge to that faced by the Scola. Forecasting the future of French art in a 1916 essay entitled The Present and the Future of French Painting, Denis questions why, if France had its own Christian music school before the war, I quote, will it not have a school of Christian decorative art after the war? Following the sacrifices and devastation of the war, surely, he continues, the pious and artistic people of France cannot but be provoked into new comparable initiatives. Three years later, he writes about his desire to create a school organized on the plan of the Schola Cantorum and which will group the various disciplines, painting, sculpture, decoration, stained glass windows around a lively, but also traditional orthodoxy. Both Denis Ateliers and Dandy's Schola harbored a very particular vision of artistic production, turning inwards and away from public appreciation towards an idealized model of the self-sustaining confraternity. The artist should submit himself to a collective discipline, they thought, thus di distancing himself or herself from modernity's obsession with individual genius. Denis asserted the importance of strictness and rigor such as he imagined to have been so important to the functioning of medieval guilds. He writes, if there is some chance of restoring and renewing tradition, it is through practice and discipline. Each student was required to present to a master a sketch for him to correct every fortnight with the aim of eventually achieving companion status once a jury of masters had approved a finished work. This strict pedagogical hierarchical model which owed much to the vision of the monastic confraternity, was a means of replacing individualistic pursuits with a collective rigor in the spirit of medieval scholasticism. One of the most celebrated projects that involved atelier students was for the Parisian church, Notre Dame de Rancy. Consecrated in 1923, it was christened by an admiring Le Corbusier as the Holy Chapel of Reinforced Concrete, being the first religious establishment to be constructed using this quintessentially modern material. Its rather astonishing window designs are by the atelier master glazier, Marguerite Auré, who was one of many female artists working within the atelier. And so to conclude, the indebtedness of Denis and Dandy to the Christian culture of the Middle Ages, as they understood it, was one thing but their attempts to make relevant the spirit of that culture to the modern age in analogous ways is something that I think personally merits greater consideration. After all, their search for a visual and oral means of spiritual expression had wide reaching effects. Pupils of Denise Atelier helped to ignite a Europe-wide resurgence of interest in modern ecclesiastical decoration. While celebrated 20th century composers from Eric Satie to Olivier Messiaen learned the art of fusing medieval chant with modernist musical idioms during their time as students at Dandy Scola. At the beginning of this talk, I drew a connection between the pre-medieval synagogue mosaic of King David and the post-modernist Cunellus installation by invoking the musical invitation we find in many of the Psalms. My own thesis project maps onto this venture too as an acknowledgement of the potential alliance of musical and artistic art forms as invitations to worship. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel, very much. Um, we are coming up to the uh, finishing line, but um, uh, let's take a few minutes to look at some of the questions that are coming forward. Um, again, I have some, but I will um, bow to the chat. Adrian, is it possible to think of this without anti-Dreyfus positions as foundational for an ongoing development? 
E.G. Fulcher, Neil McWilliams' new book, is it Fulcher, sorry, Neil McWilliams' new book has rather changed and deepened a movement that includes Dumier, Monarco, Fascists, etc. I yeah, I'll respond to that now. Um, thank you, Adrian. That's a really good point. Um, and I would, ideally, if I had an hour, um, I would talk a bit more about the cultural politics of the time, because, as you say, the, um, the sort of cultural dichotomy that arose from the Dreyfus affair is super important and super central. Um, I'm actually, I'm halfway through reading Neil McWilliams' new book. Um, so, ah, I see he says, I wish you could. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure, yeah, it's... This is more to do with the sort of Catholicism side of things. So I don't know how much sort of detail I should uh, go into, but I suppose obviously it's all it's all part of that um, that area. So Dandy would have sided with the anti Dreyfusards, um, and there's some sort of difficult politics that comes into some of the stuff that I'm writing about, which I couldn't talk about today, but which I think should be acknowledged. And that is the sort of uh, conservative reactionary ideas that can come with some of this kind of neo-Catholicism stuff. So Dandy was known as actually being quite anti-Semitic um, and people tend to lump Maurice Denis in with him as also being anti-Semitic, even though if you read Denis' diary entries, that's very much not the case. And I'm kind of, in my project, I'm trying to create sort of, I'm trying to dig a little bit deeper essentially um, to go into the complexities um, of anti-Semitism within this period. Um, but yeah, maybe um, maybe I'll leave leave it for another time. The uh, rest of the stuff. <laughs> thank you, Rachel. And Adrian also says thank you. And um, there's a comment here from Nina. Um, interesting to see how many women are pupils in the atelier of sacred art when women were mainly muses in the modernist atelier. And also, when could women enroll in the secular academy of beaux arts? A fascinating talk and beautiful geometric and decorative monumental windows by a woman, Sophie Arp, made small pieces. Mm, thank I, you, Nina. Oh, sorry. No, no, please, please. Um, yeah, I love those. I love those window designs. And actually, I really want to write some more about Marguerite Huré, because as far as I know, no one's really written, certainly not in English, no one's written anything about her. Um, and also Georges Duvalier, um, his wife, Sabine, was head of the sort of textile department at the Atelier d'Art Sacré. So she created all the, all the robes, all of the, well, all of the textiles sort of that were part of this whole gesamt Kunstwerk of the uh, cathedral and the church environment. So I think there's so much more work that can be done um, on the absolutely central role of female artists within this, um, within this world. Thank you, Rachel. Um, it strikes me that this, the, you know, the discussion of antisemitism and secularism, um, you know, in the context of, of your of your presentation of, of, of French, uh, you know, French um, musical and art history, it really points up something that I, I think is is very important for us to remember when we when we talk about um, you know religion and art in our forum, and that is that um, you know these questions are of course very culturally specific. And um, it's been really helpful to have a sort of perspective um, from France. Um, you know, I remember I'm old enough to have been taught art history at art school. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, so of course I learned, to, I learned about Maurice Denis, but, you know, I don't remember there being any real discussion of religious content of his work, you know, and that's, I'm, well, that's perhaps that's because I was a bit ignorant, but 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 I think it's also I, well, I know it's also that you know it's a it's a function of the of the sort of secularism, okay, of of British art education, and and it's it's taken me quite a while to realise that that British secularism is not the same as French secularism, for example, you know, um, British secularism kind of just erases religion, whereas in France you know, it's still kind of, um, and, you know, there's anti-clericalism. I mean, anti-clericalism doesn't mean anything in, in, the, in Britain, really, mm. you know, for example. Anyway, so, so mm. I think that it's really helpful. And, um, you know, if I may just say in closing, because um, we are at time, um, before I just formally thank everybody, you know, it's, it's, it's really struck me tonight, you know, how, um, 
how this forum is is generating you know so many questions and i think i hope that we'll be able to you know build on these and invite people back and maybe even you know maybe even um, people might even kind of connect with one another and make joint presentations i don't know because connections are being made here so you know there's a lot of in very interesting important questions that have been raised tonight and uh, apologies that we haven't had time to go into more depth with some of them. But um, I hope everyone here will agree that we've had a very rich evening. Thank you so much to our presenters, David, Helen and Rachel, and um, also for all your wonderful comments and uh, questions from the floor. Thank you so much. We will see you next month. If you can make it, we will keep e emailing you. Um, James will email you until you ask him to stop. Um, so thank you so much. Have a good evening, everybody. Stay safe. God bless.